the epistle for this Mass. This is Saturday before Palm Sunday. It's the prophecy of Jeremiah, who lived about 600 years before Christ, 600, 700 years before Christ. And this prophecy speaks of our Lord's death. In those days, the wicked Jews said one to another, Come, and let us invent devices against the just one. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, and let us strike him with the tongue, and let us give no heed to all his words. Give heed to me, O Lord, and hear the voice of my adversaries. Shall evil be rendered for good, because they have dug a pit before my soul? Remember that I have stood in thy sight to speak good for them and to turn away thine indignation from them. Therefore deliver up their children to famine and bring them into the hands of the sword. Let their wives be bereaved of children and widows and let their husbands be slain by death. Let their young men be stabbed with the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard out of their houses for thou shalt bring the the robber upon them suddenly. Because they have dug a pit to take me, and have hid snares for my feet. But thou, O Lord, knowest all their counsel against me unto death. Forgive not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from thy sight. Let them be overthrown before thine eyes. In the time of thy wrath do thou destroy them, O Lord our God. The epistle of the gospel taken from St. John chapter 12. At that time the chief priests brought to, they thought to kill Lazarus. For many of the Jews, by reason of him, went away and believed in Jesus. And on the next day a great multitude that was come to the festival day, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, O Sana, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Sion, behold thy king cometh sitting on the colt of an ass. These things his disciples did not know at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things to him. The multitude therefore gave testimony which was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead. For which reason also the people came to meet him, because they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Do you see that we we prevail nothing? Behold, the whole world is gone after him. Now there were certain Gentiles among them who came up to adore on the festival day. These therefore came to Philip, who was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. Again Andrew and Philip told Jesus. And Jesus answering them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the, into the ground and dies, itself remains alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world keepeth it unto eternal life. If any man minister to me, let him follow me, and where I am, there also (coughs) shall my minister be. If any man minister to me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause I came into this hour. Father, glorify thy name. A voice therefore came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The multitude therefore that stood and heard said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, 
I will draw all things to myself. Now this he said, signifying what death he should die. The multitude answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus therefore said to them, Yet a little while the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, that the darkness overtake you not. And he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Whilst you have the light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of the light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> Palm Sunday, our Lord Jesus Christ enters Jerusalem. He fulfills the prophecy, the prophecy that says he will ride, come into Jerusalem meek. The king will become, come into Jerusalem meek as a lamb riding on a donkey. And as he enters Jerusalem, all the, the people here have heard about Christ raising Lazarus from the dead, all his miracles. And so they are all moved to glorify the King, King of David, and the King of the Jews, which Christ truly is. So the Holy Ghost moves this crowd. And the Pharisees, of course, the Jews, the head Jews, the leading Jews, are, they hate Christ, and they have already vowed to kill Lazarus. They've already vowed to not, some of them have, have vowed not to eat until Christ is dead. So here is building up all the way, the, the powers of the darkness and the light are building up when the darkness will think they've had victory, when they finally put Christ to death. They think they will have won, but as God works straight lines with uh, out of crooked lines uh, he draws out of evil much good so out of the death of the cross he brought the greatest good and that greatest good is the redemption of souls souls from hell and notice the sword the cross is a shape of a sword because it's prefigured when david the uh, when little david killed goliath the little stone that he struck him with in the forehead and Goliath went falling like a huge tree. And then David jumped on his back, took his sword, threw off his helmet and chopped his head off. Because David, remember, he must, he must have been a strong young man because at, at this age he was watching the sheep. He had already wrestled with a bear, killed it. He had already killed also a lion with his own bare hands to protect the flock of his sheep. So that use of the sword, the devil didn't know, and the Jews didn't know. They knew all the prophecies that the Messiah was supposed to be powerful, he was supposed to be forever, he was supposed to be great, that the angels will surround him, that he will come with power and glory. They all read that in the scriptures, but they forgot Isaiah's prophecies, they forgot Jeremiah's prophecies. They forgot many other prophecies, the lamentations that speak of Christ must die, Christ must be crucified. He will be, be all these details of the passion are foretold 500, 600, 1,000 years before Christ. And he will be sold for 30 pieces of silver by Judas. That was foretold by the prophet Zacharias 300 years before the event. He would ride on a donkey. That's another prophecy 300 years before him. That he would, they have pierced my hands and my feet. They have numbered all my bones. That's the prophecy of St. David, a thousand years before Christ. And then um, the numerous, numerous prophecies. Not a bone of his shall be broken. But they've numbered all my bones. Because at the scourging, when our Lord was so violently scourged, on the front and on the back, and he was suspended like this on the pulley, with his toes barely touching the ground. And the pulley was anchored to the marble pillar, which now stands in St. Praxed's Basilica in Rome. Archbishop Lefebvre used to go often there to pray. 
So when our Lord was scourged, as you know, there was the shroud shows three teams of scourges, each two soldiers each. And by the time they were finished, they were wiped out. They were exhausted. So the next two would come up. And the Romans used to have kind of a chalk, a chalk game to see who could hit the hardest, who could sp splash the most, who could make the victim drop. And for with our Lord and with the Lamb of God, the true Messiah, the Jews forgot these details, that he would be a leper from head to foot. He would be the true man of sorrows. He would, there would be nothing handsome any, in him anymore. From head to foot, he would look like a leper. And he did, from head to foot, crowned on the top of his head with a huge helmet of thorns. This is what the shroud shows, because the Persian kings, they didn't just wear a laurel wreath like the Romans. The Persian kings wore like a huge helmet, like a hockey helmet or a football helmet. So when they mocked Christ as king, they, they had no trouble making a helmet for him. So there's three parts to the crown of the thorns. <clears throat> the, the circular one around, around the top of his head, which we're most familiar with seeing. Then the huge helmet, the whole mass of thorns. And then a clump of sharp thorns on the top of the crown of his head, where the space was. And then they mocked his kingship by striking him digging the thorns into his head. And head wounds bleed the most. So Christ, his eyes filled with blood. His whole beard was filled with blood. His whole, he was just dripping with blood. So these details, also that he would be transfixed on the cross. That was another prophecy hundreds of years before Christ. He would be transfixed, that is, a sword driven through into his heart but not a bone of his shall be broken. So this is why the Jews, especially the leading Jews, the wicked Jews, the Pharisees, who burdened the people with 630 human precepts. And they were, if they didn't meet these human laws that they made up, they weren't God's laws, his commandments, who taught mercy and justice and love of neighbor and love of God. But their, their 630 precepts, such as one time they got angry with the apostles and they said, why do your apostles eat the corn out of the fields when they don't even wash their hands seven times before they eat? And, and Christ said, he, got all, he rebuked them for their human laws, which, and they, he said, you forget the, the most important laws, which is mercy and which is love of God and neighbor and the true justice. So um, the Jews were blinded. They were blinded by their 630 man-made, made-up human laws. And they forgot the prophecies that all pointed to Christ dying on the cross, being scourged at the pillar, being mocked, being crowned with thorns. He will say, Isaiah, uh, in, in the prophecy of David, I am ego sum vermis et non homo. I am a worm and not a man. He was kicked so violently on the way of the cross. When, the, when our Lord fell, they would just surround him like a pack of, pack of dogs and bulls, as Psalm 21 says. And they kicked him so violently, his kidneys stopped working. So all that urea that the kidneys purify out of the blood went into the pores, went off, out into his skin and burned his skin. But it's because of that urea, that acid, the image of the shroud is so clear. And the shroud, as you know, we have, th we have four great treasures of the claws that wrapped Christ's body. We've got the shroud of Turin. Scientists of the last 50, 70 years have always tried to disprove it, to say it's just a forgery, it's a painting. But the more they put it under scientific study, the more they're stunned to see this is, this is not a painting. And the image is 3D. When they, when they put the image through uh, a, like a CAT scan, the image came out on the other side three-dimensional. It was as if there was a body under the cloth. 
and they all got the chills because they said this is not this is not normal and the image of Christ is 3D because his body when he rose from the dead his body passed through the cloth but it bears all the marks of the passion the crowning with thorns his swollen cheek his beard clumps of it ripped out his whole body mangled from head to foot and he was scourged naked because on the shroud is clear his, his naked body is ripped to pieces and this is what Christ means when he says the hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified Amen, Amen, I say to you unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies who's this grain of wheat? who's this wheat? when you, you ladies know and um, when you, how do you make wheat? How do you make flour? You've got to take grains of wheat, smash it, crush it, right? That's how you get the flour. Christ was the grain of wheat. He is St. Saint Ambrose. Christ is that grain of wheat. And that grain of wheat was crushed in the Passion, crucified on the cross, and buried. So that grain of wheat was crushed into flour, buried in the tomb. And unless the grain of wheat, says our Lord, falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. And what's the fruit? Christ, he rose from the dead the third day after. He rose from the dead. There were at least some up to a hundred soldiers guarding the tomb. Because the Jews wanted to make sure, make sure they don't steal the body. The apostles are going to steal the body because he said he would rise on the third day. So they put guards on the tomb. <laughs> and these guards paid Roman guards who are vigilant in their duty throughout the night watch. In the early morning, probably around 4.30, 5 in the morning. In the summer, in the early spring, in the morning it hits around 4.35 it's at that hour that the tremendous earthquake and Christ rose from the dead. And the huge rock blocking the tomb, which was sealed with the Caesar's waxed seal on the wax, it was sealed with chains and ropes. So when the guards saw this earthquake and saw the rock roll and the light emitted from the tomb, they were, the, the, the scripture says, they fell as if dead. Velut mortui. They were so scared. So imagine uh, uh, the, the soldiers on guard in a cemetery and one of the bodies comes to life. <laughs> this is the idea. Put yourself in that setting when they're, they're being paid to watch a dead body and they're thinking, this is ridiculous. Why are we being paid to watch a dead body? But there they go. They'll take the pay. But in the early morning, the resurrection and the tremendous earthquake the second earthquake, because the first one was on Good Friday. <coughs> and they didn't see Christ's body, they just saw the tomb empty. And they took off and ran to the, the high priest and said, we don't know how this happened, we can't explain it, but he's not in the tomb, and no one came and took him. We were on our duty. And so the Jews said, well, how can we pay you if the body's missing? They said, we don't know. But from within, there was an earthquake. You, you felt the earthquake. And the rock rolled. And the, the tomb was empty. So the Jews said, we'll pay you. We'll pay you. And we're going to pay you extra that you tell everyone who asks that the, that the apostles came and took his body. Because they didn't want the resurrection prophecy fulfilled. But it was. And the apostles were nothing to fear. They were like mice hiding from the Jews. They were dead scared. And they betrayed and ran from our Lord on Good Friday and Holy Thursday night. So our Lord rose from the dead. And this is what is meant. Unless, but if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Because 40 days later, Christ will ascend into heaven. And he becomes the cornerstone and that cornerstone is laid in heaven. And that, that God is building, says Psalm 121, He is building the heavenly city. 
So you are the stones, we are the stones now being chiseled on this earth, says St. Augustine. Each one of us are born with original sin. We're born chained with the devil, devil's chains on us. Our soul is black from original sin, from the first Adam and Eve. We're all born disfigured in the soul. And the blood of Christ washes the soul by baptism. But what stays? The stain of sin is washed away, but the effects of sin remain. And this is where St. Augustine says, God chisels us. All the disappointments, all the crosses, all the tears of this life are God's chiseling us because He's the master sculptor. And He wants to bring out of each soul a saint to be placed in the heavenly, the heavenly walls of the heavenly Jerusalem. And not that the saints in heaven are dead stones, they're living stones. And St. Peter says this, the first pope, addressing the first Catholics, he tells them, you are the living stones that God is preparing for the heavenly city. So you must be docile to God's hand. Let Him form you and seek Him with all your heart. Keep His commandments. Love the Lord God with all your heart and mind and soul. And He will chisel you. And look what He did with His own mother. No, wo no woman suffered more than the Virgin Mary. No woman. And she stood at the foot of the cross and, and uh, she was the one that felt the transfixion. Christ was already dead. And when the soldier struck the spear through his heart and opened it and outpoured water and blood gushing out, she felt that puncture of her heart. So the Virgin Mary, she is the chosen dove of Christ, the garden enclosed. She's the most beautiful creation of God after our Lord Jesus Christ in his human nature. So it brings forth much fruit. And the much fruit is when Christ says, I, I am the, the living bread that has come down from heaven. How do you make bread? You need flour, right? You need water. Water is baptism. And the water and flour mix and you make a dough. And the dough needs to be cooked to make bread, right? So this cooking is done by heat, fire. And the fire on the soul is the, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost by confirmation. Confirmation, as it were, cooks us in the oven to become one bread with Christ. One bread, one body. And this is what's called the mystical body of Christ. Christ is the head. And those who profess the Catholic faith, those who believe all He taught, and those who live in the state of grace, they are living members of Christ's mystical body. A, a head without a body is a monster. A body without a head is a monster. So Christ is head of his mystical body, and the mystical body is his Catholic Church. And it's made up of all the members, of all the people who have professed the faith from the beginning of Adam and Eve down to the end of the world. They make up the mystical body of Christ. But we have to believe all that Christ taught. And this is the problem with the modern world. The modern world says any belief... Any God leads to, leads to heaven. You can choose the religion of your choice. And that's not what Christ taught. I am the door, he said. No one comes to the Father but through me. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the only way. And this way, he's made it very clear in the scripture, the seven sacraments. We must participate in the seven sacraments. We must participate in the sacrifice of the Mass which is the, the real Calvary of Christ crucified, made present on the altar. And we feed the soul by His living body, blood, soul, and divinity, by the Holy Eucharist. And obviously you, can't, you don't have Mass all the time, every Sunday, but you can make, and you should make every day, spiritual communions. Which is basically to tell our Lord, Lord, I want to receive you in communion. Come and fill my soul with your grace. Move my soul, convert me to love you more, to keep your commandments, to battle against sin and the attacks of the devil, the flesh, the world. <coughs> so, it brings forth much fruit. That fruit is all the saints who will be reaped from the harvest of this field on this earth, 
That's all the saints who go to heaven. And all the saints who go to heaven through the blood of Christ, through his holy Catholic Church. And St. Peter is the first to teach this. St. Peter, the first Pope, he's the first to say, he points to Noah's Ark, and he says, during the flood, only eight souls were saved. The whole world drowned. Everybody drowned. And geography and archaeology undigs all this. The Grand Canyon is, is an is a open book of the flood of Noah. And they find, of course, without going into great detail, they find uh, seashells, salt crystals from the ocean on top of mountains. The whole earth was, un, was underwater. And the fountains of the deep burst. So only eight were saved from Noah's Ark, in the Ark, and all the animals. This prefigured, it was a real historic event, but this also prefigures the Catholic Church. This is St. Peter teaching this. That's why when you walk into a, a Catholic Church that's built traditionally, when you walk in, you see the long, narrow nave. And the main altar is way up on the, in the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies separated by the communion rail. But up, up the long aisle is called the nave. And navis in Latin means the ship. And when you look at a traditional built church, it looks like an upside down boat almost. Because the Catholic Church is the ship outside of which everybody drowns. Because Christ founded this church. He taught what seven sacraments to, to, that he instituted. He taught all that we must believe. And so powerful is this teaching, the whole Catholic faith is already contained and being taught by the apostles. So much so that St. Paul will say, we've already taught you the faith. And if an eye or an angel come back and teach to you a different doctrine, let him be cast out from you. Don't listen to him. If he teaches a different faith, Allah, Muhammad, Buddha, false Protestant interpretations of the Bible. If anyone comes to you teaching you a different faith, don't listen to them. And that's why, this is why now in the modern world, this is 2017, we're 100 years after Fatima. In 1917, the whole world was more or less Catholic. In 1917, there was a good pope in the throne, Pope Pius XI. And all the Catholic countries were... were you, you could walk into any Catholic church, and it'd be the Tridentine Latin Mass. And you'd hear the same doctrine taught in the pulpits. And you'd go to confession, and a sin is a sin, and you need to be forgiven. So here we are now, a hundred years after <coughs> Fatima, and it's as if the whole world has been turned upside down. And the Virgin Mary foretold all this would happen, Gabriella. This is the whole world has been turned upside down. Why? Because of obviously World War I, which was to smash the last Catholic monarchies left. World War II, which was to sell, give the Israelites their land, which was not properly their land, and to spread the communism throughout the East and in the name of democracy betray some of these countries to communism such as Poland, Ukraine and the whole East. So World War III we're on the verge of and we might be entering into God knows but we know that World War III will be quite a disaster. The Virgin Mary said that whole nations will be annihilated, blown off the face of the earth. And the worst disaster in the history of the church is Vatican II, which was the nuclear blast within the church. So now if you walk into a, your local diocesan churches, first you see a new mass, a new altar, you see a different religion preached, you hear a Vatican II doctrines preached, ecumenism, that all religions are, e are equal in God's eyes, they all lead to the truth. These are false beliefs. And the priesthood has been attacked. And the priesthood has been directly attacked. As the enemies of Christ said, if priests won't become communists, communists will become priests. And they infiltrated the seminaries. And Bella Dodd told this to Bishop Sheen. When she converted from communism to Catholicism, 
she said, I was responsible for at least, what is it, up to 10 or 100,000, 10,000, or I forget how many, 1,000 or 10,000 seminarians who went into the seminaries to infiltrate from within. And now they're bishops, now they're priests, imploding the church from within. So, you walk into any church, you can't find the Catholic religion anymore. You don't find it taught, you don't find the true Mass, you got a goofy Mass with the priest facing the altar, with the people, it's all man-centered instead of God-centered. So this is the disaster Our Lady foretold, the, the loss of the faith from the very top. The Pope himself would lose the faith. And we've had five Popes promoting a new religion, a new Mass. And this is why, what do we do in this disaster? What do we do when the, the whole world has been turned upside down? Do we go with it? It's easier, that's for sure. Do we break the commandments and just ignore God? Well, the conscience will never be at peace. The wicked know no peace, says the Holy Ghost. And so what do we do? We say we have to obey the Pope, but if the Pope is imposing a false religion on us in a new Mass, do we obey him? We can't. And like St. Peter told the, the political authority of his, their day, <coughs> we must obey God before men. We must obey God before men, because they were arresting them, they were threatening them with death if they preached the Catholic, the Catholic faith. So where are we now? We, we are seeing the, the infiltration of Catholic tradition since the Bishop Fillet's betrayal of 2012 when he signed on to accepting Vatican II in the light of so-called light of tradition, the new Mass, the new Code of Canon Law, the new Profession of Faith. We can't accept that. We have to stay Catholic. If I or an angel preach to you another gospel than the one you've already heard, don't listen to him. Let them be anathema, says St. Paul. So these are new religions, and these are new teachings, and these are new masses, and these are new sacraments, and we must have no part with them. So to stay Catholic, we're left to a handful all over the world. As the Virgin Mary foretold at, at La Salette, she said the faith would be kept by families, farmhouses, you know, little areas of, of uh, those keeping the Catholic faith. And that's where we are today. That's where we are today. So we have to fight on. We have to love our Lord and stand with Him at the foot of the cross. That is our privilege and that's our honor now. To be with our Lord at the foot of the cross when the whole world has turned from Him and on top of that mocks Him and are boasting about a new world order, a new world religion. Even Pope Francis and Pope Benedict XVI have spoken about this scandal, the one world religion and one world authority, one world banking system. And this whole one world order that St. Pius X prophesied will be given, preparing for the Antichrist. That's what it's preparing for. And when the Antichrist comes on the scene, it's going to be pretty tough to be Catholic. It's going to be real tough to stay faithful to Catholic tradition. It's going to be tough to save your soul because he's going to unleash the, the, one of the worst persecutions on the church. He will invent new tortures and revive old ones, said the prophecies. He'll reign three and a half years. But that's what the whole, the, that's the Jews' Messiah. The Jews who rejected Christ, the synagogue of Satan, their Messiah is the Antichrist. And we, we obviously, we, we, we have no part with that, that false antichrist. But Archbishop Lefebvre called the modernists in Rome, these bishops betraying the faith, and the Pope betraying our Lord, like St. Peter betrayed our Lord. He called them agents of the antichrist. And he's right, because they are preparing the one world religion by ecumenism. They uncrown Christ the King by religious liberty, false religious liberty. And uh, they destroy the Mass with the new Mass, from sacrifice of Christ on the cross to a parish picnic. So, dear faithful, this is where we must continue fighting. We must <coughs> ask the grace of God to persevere 
like those first apostles, when on that Good Friday, they, you know, they all lost the faith. St. Peter lost the faith. Saint even St. Even Saint John lost the faith. They, they no longer believed that Christ was God. The only Catholic that stood on the face of the earth, on the whole world on Good Friday, the only one that had the faith, other than our Lord on the cross, was the Virgin Mary. She never doubted He would rise from the dead. She never doubted He was God. She knew that God so loved the world that He would give His life of His only begotten Son to die on the cross to save us from hell. So let's ask the Virgin Mary to stay faithful, stay close to her, stay next to her. She's our mother in heaven. And she warned us these days would come. At La Salette she said, the, the Rome will lose the faith and become the seed of the Antichrist. She said only the faith will survive. Many will lose the Mass. Like you know, you don't have the Mass every Sunday. We priests are traveling over 52 missions all over the U.S. and Canada. And in South America, the priests there are traveling all the time to preserve the true faith, to help you come to our Lord and forgive your sins in confession, feed your soul with the body and blood of the soul of Christ. But when you don't have Mass, it's the faith you've got to survive on. <coughs> so, Our Lady of, of Fatima, she said uh, communism would spread everywhere and whole nations would be annihilated. We're there. How do you know communism? Obviously, we don't have tanks in our streets yet. We don't have barbed wire fences and rounding up to the gulags yet. But what is the essence of communism? Atheistic life, atheistic thinking. <coughs> communism says we're just another species inhabiting the earth with other species, the animals. And when you die, you just die like an animal. And you don't have an eternal soul. You don't have an immortal soul. That's what communism teaches. And it, the communism despises God's laws. So only a communist system could, could allow abortion laws. Only a communist system could allow divorce laws, could allow the sodomite laws, could am, uh, allow the assisted suicide laws, and organ transplantation laws, that, that where one has to kill a victim to get his heart to transplant the heart. That's immoral to kill someone to get their heart or liver. So it, we are atheistic in our thinking as a nation, as a nation. The, the, the atheism has taken over. In our schools, what's taught? Evolution. The children don't learn they're created by God. They learn that they evolved from, uh, after billions of years from apes and monkeys. Ridiculous. But, but it affects the morals. If, you're, if you come from an ape, you can act like an ape. <laughs> and, so, and so they spit on God's laws. So, dear faithful, you little flock, remember what Our Lady warned us. These days would come when you have to search for Christ, try to find Him, and stay faithful to the true fa faith of all time, to the true Mass, to the true sacraments. And only those who love will find Him. Only those who love our Lord and pray with all humility, and Lord, help me find you, help me love you, help me be faithful to you. We have to chase after our Lord. And this is why so many abandon Him. Because the devil, of course, he has no shortage of sweets. He has no shortage of temptations to lure us away from the true path. To lure us away from the narrow path that leads to heaven and take the broad road that leads to hell. And the broad way is live according to your passions, live according to despising God's laws, you can remarry, you can divorce, remarry, you can have abortions, you can use contraception, you can use NFP, you don't have to take the children God sends you, and uh, you can uh, say all religions are the same, and so you don't, have, you don't have problems, you don't have polemics, you don't have fights, because you say all religions more or less lead to God, well, everybody can live peacefully with that. <coughs> but did Christ teach that? Did our Lord teach Always, Buddha leads to heaven, Allah, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, Martin Luther. He never taught that. I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. And the first pope preached this. Uh, outside of the name of our, our Lord Jesus Christ, 
There is no salvation out of his name and out of his holy Catholic Church. So, little flock, you persevere, keep fighting, keep the daily rosary, and in this week, draw close to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Passion of our Lord. Try to read every day the Missal, because every day this week, starting Palm Sunday, is a special Mass, all focused on the Passion of our Lord. And, and remember what, how dear our Lord to our Lord is to think of His Passion. Meditate on His Passion. Speak to our Lord who really died for your soul. I think, obviously, when you go to confession, I think, well, certainly all or most of you have, when you go to confession, what washed your soul? What washed your soul from all its sins? And we increased the life of grace. It was the blood of Christ. The blood that cost Him so much suffering. He washes your soul and increases in you His divine life and grace and the virtues. And very soon you're going to eat His body, blood, soul, and divinity. You're going to receive the divine fire in Holy Communion. So ask that fire to inflame in us all a great love of God. Because that is the first commandment. Love of God above all things. So we need to pray for this. Because it's so easy to love many other things, isn't it? Many other passing temporal things. Cars, clothes, this, that, but they're all passing. Even our, even our life and our health. Christ says, who seeks his life in this world shall lose it. But who loses his life for my sake will find it. And how do we lose our life for Christ's sake? Well, keep his commandments. Keep the holy Catholic faith of tradition. And you lose many friends. You lose many, now you lose your parishes. You lose your you're, you can't go to the Navasoto Parish. You can't go to the, now the new Neo SSPX Parish because they've all compromised on the Holy Faith. So it's painful. It's painful for all of us. This this marginalization of of all the masses from the truth, and for those who stay with the truth, it takes a lot of guts and a lot of love and a lot of grace, and we have to pray to be faithful. But it's happened many times in history too, when the faith hung on a handful of people, a handful of those who were faithful. So dear faithful, persevere, and remember what Our Lady warned us, and she told us what to do. Pray my rosary, wear my scapular, be devoted to me, and I will lead you, she says, to my divine son. So fight on. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.